Uh, good morning, everyone, to those of you who are joining us, and good evening to those of you uh, who are in India. Uh, I'm Milan Vaishnav from the Carnegie Endowment for International Peace. I'm uh, very honored today to host the special Google Hangout in conjunction with uh, Sadhanand Dume of the American Enterprise Institute, uh, where we have a chance to hear from uh, a central figure in the uh, Modi government, uh, Mr. Jan Sinha, who is the uh, Union uh, Minister of State for Finance. Uh, he is going to be speaking to us today about the state of the economy, the Modi government's first 18 months, the current winter session of parliament, and, and hopefully highlight for us uh, some of the themes going forward uh, in the remaining, uh, remainder of, of this government's tenure. Uh, he's going to start out by giving a short presentation about where we are today and, and, and where the government would like to uh, uh, continue in the, in the next few months. Uh, I'll follow up with a few questions, and then we're going to hear from uh, two excellent commentators. Uh, first, we'll hear from uh, Sadan Andume, who is my co-host at AEI, a resident fellow who works on the political economy of South Asia and is a regular columnist for the Wall Street Journal. Next, I'll turn to Pranjal Bandari, who is uh, uh, the chief economist, chief India economist at HSBC. She's based in Mumbai. Uh, we hope that you'll be sending us uh, questions either via the Google Hangout uh, application for those of you who are using that. You can also send us uh, questions via YouTube or on Twitter, uh, hopefully to the end of this conversation, which will end uh, in about an hour's time. We'll have time to take some of your questions. Without further ado, let me introduce uh, Jayan Sinha, as I uh, before mentioned. He's the Union Minister of State for Finance. Uh, Lok Sabha Member of Parliament from Hazaribagh in Jharkhand, has had a long and distinguished career uh, in business. Uh, he's known to many of you who are going to be watching this, both in the United States, Europe, and in India. He is, I think, uh, suffice it to say, a critical member of Narendra Modi's economic team, uh, working closely with both the Prime Minister as well as the Finance Minister on key initiatives related to insurance, banking, tax reform, any number of issues which I hope we're going to get to today. So without any further delay, let me turn it over to uh, Jayan Sinha. Who appears to have dropped off the Google Hangout. Um, it looks like he's coming back on now. Um, let's just bear with me for a minute. There you are. Sorry, Milan, uh, we just uh, lost you there for a little That's while. okay. I just finished introducing you, so I think the floor is yours. Okay, terrific. Well, uh, Milan, very good to be with you this evening. Uh, hi to Pranjul and to Sadhanand as well. Uh, and uh, uh, hello to everybody who's joined us on this Google Hangout. What I thought I would do uh, before we got into uh, the Q&A uh, is to actually provide uh, the framework that we're using uh, for our economic policy making. Uh, and for that, what I'll do is I'll put up a couple of charts and talk through those uh, so that you get a graphic sense uh, of how we are thinking about our economic policy making. All right. Can you all see the chart that says economic policy framework? Yes. Yes. OK, great. So the way to read the chart is to first look on the left-hand side uh, and, uh, and then on the right-hand side, which tells you a little bit about what the framework is. And of course, what we're really trying to do, which is uh, uh, you know, the part in the center, is building uh, the India of our dreams. Uh, and to build the India of our dreams, obviously, first and foremost, we have to eradicate poverty. Uh, we have to create massive employment for our young workforce. Uh, we want agriculture to be sustainable in the long run, uh, to have uh, much more productive agriculture uh, so that we can increase uh, food production uh, and at the same time get people out of agriculture uh, and into manufacturing and services, which is really the way uh, economic development has happened around the world over the last century or so. Uh, obviously, uh, as we have people coming into cities, uh, we want to make sure that the quality of life uh, is, is much better for everyone. Uh, and then, of course, uh, uh, we want to work on social inclusion, uh, women empowerment, and food and resource security. So these, in a way, are our objectives. This is what we're really trying to accomplish uh, through our economic policy framework. And I think most governments in India uh, would, would
would agree uh, with these goals. So it's not really that uh, uh, goals or objectives are that different bit across governments. All governments want to create jobs and eliminate poverty. Really, the question is how you do it. And that's where you know the way we are doing it uh, is very different from the way uh, previous governments have done it, uh, particularly uh, Congress governments. But it is very consistent with the way that uh, Atal Bihari Vajpayee Ji's government did it uh, between 1998 and 2004. And really the strategy uh, is that we want to build India's productive capacity. Uh, and I'm on the left side of the page of this chart. Uh, and we really want to make sure that we build our productive capacity, we strengthen our global competitiveness, and we do that with an investment-led approach, a supply-side orientation. And that's very different from the UPA's approach, uh, which was much more focused on consumption and the demand side. So we are much more supply-side and investment-oriented, and much less consumption and supply-side oriented. Uh, and that really is, is a very important for us uh, because we recognize uh, that uh, unless we build India's supply side, we build up India's productive capacity, we cannot sustain our growth in the long run. We may have a few years of fast growth, but soon supply side bottlenecks will catch up with us. Uh, and, you know, the 7, 8, 9 percent growth that we would enjoy in the boom part of the cycle uh, would uh, come down dramatically as it did in the last cycle where we went from 7, 8, 9 percent growth to well below 5 percent for two years. So these boom bust cycles happen if you don't build up the supply side. You run into the supply side bottlenecks, uh, inflation picks up, you start running large fiscal deficits. Uh, and then, of course, the economic growth cannot continue. So we are very focused on the supply side, and we understand that to uh, really build India's productive capacity, we need to build both the hard assets as well as the soft assets. And the hard assets, of course, uh, all of you understand, it's transportation, it's power, it's manufacturing, housing, uh, digital India in terms of telecom connectivity and broadband access. These are the hard assets that we need to invest in and build up in the economy. But we also recognize that we need to build India's soft assets, which is education so that our people uh, have good skills, they are employable, uh, they can get good jobs. We naturally need to strengthen our judicial system so that the challenges we have right now uh, in terms of uh, the judicial backlog uh, that we have out there uh, comes down. We obviously want to have balanced regulatory mechanisms and regulatory institutions uh, that can really uh, ensure that uh, uh, competition and uh, and markets work well and then ultimately we need to have an entrepreneurial and innovation ecosystem so that we get wave after wave of innovation so as we build India's productive capacity our strategy really is to focus both on the hard assets as well as on the soft assets so that's the strategy now even as we are following through on our strategies we are building the India of our dreams we are following certain core principles that define our economic thinking and as Honorable Prime Minister said in his famous speech, his historic speech on May 20th, uh, 2014, when he gave the speech in the Central Hall of Parliament, we are a government that works tirelessly on behalf of the poor that is dedicated to the poor. And this is a moral imperative for us. This is a Rashtra Dharam, uh, as we say in Hindi. It is, in fact, uh, the, 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 the right way to, uh, to really uh, you know, operating a government in India to focus our resources and dedicate the government to uplift the poor and ensure that the deprivation and the destitution that we have in India is once and for all eliminated. So we are a pro-poor government. That's front and center in our economic policy making. But because we are a pro-poor government, because we are focused on ensuring uh, that, uh, that we have to uh, uh, dedicate resources to the poor, we are also a pro-market government. We are a, a government that understands that to create economic surplus, to create wealth, to create jobs, we have to be pro-market and pro-competition and pro-innovation. So all of our policies really are focused on ensuring markets work well, that resources are dedicated uh, to where the, the, the most productive users are. Uh, and that's really central to our policy making as well. The third very important principle that we follow is one of empowerment, not entitlement. And there I want to distinguish between a safety net and an entitlement uh, approach uh, towards, uh, towards rights. So the UPA government, of course, uh, believed in a right to education, a right to food, uh, you know, a right to, uh, to a variety of other things. Uh, and our approach is much more to be able to build uh, a high quality safety net so that everyone is protected, 
but then to provide the opportunities and the resources so that people can really improve their lives. So it's about empowerment, providing the safety net so that people feel secure. And then from there on, it's up to them to really improve their lives. So it's empowerment, not entitlement. The next uh, statement is one that the Honorable Prime Minister has used many times, which is minimum government, maximum governance. We want government to be small, we want government to be lean, we want government to be rule-based uh, so that we run a transparent, efficient state. Uh, and of course, at the same time, because we are policy-driven, we are rule-based, we are able to provide high-quality governance and we want to apply and use uh, all of the most advanced technology uh, to really you know, simplify things here for people. And then finally, we believe in cooperative federalism. Uh, India cannot progress unless the states really, really do well. Uh, and so we have been moving more and more resources and more and more responsibility to the states so that we can work in partnership with the states uh, and really move India forward and build the India of our dreams. And that is why the Honorable Prime Minister talks about Team India. Uh, Team India is the center in the states working together to, uh, to build India. Uh, so this is our economic policy framework. Uh, on the next page, uh, Milan, can you see the next page? Uh, we we can see the next page. Is it possible for you to make this the slide full size or full screen? I think it's a little bit small, um, but we can see it. It's come. I still have. Yeah, we have it, as a, Milan. We have it as a full screen here. Okay. Okay. Uh, so I'm not sure we can do much more than that. Okay. Uh, but basically, what we have done in this slide. Uh, is to uh, is to highlight you know how our sabka saath sabka vikas uh, philosophy uh, flows out in terms of important beneficiaries and you know what is the infrastructure that actually supports these important initiatives. So the idea of sabka saath sabka vikas, uh, of course, is to be able to provide benefits to all Indians and all Indian citizens. And here, the three most important priorities for us. Uh, the three thrust areas, if you will, from a policy making perspective is Yuvaon Ko Rojgaar, which means jobs for young people, Kisano Ki Samriddhi, uh, prosperity for farmers, and Garibon Ka Uthar, which means upliftment of, of the poor. And so all of the different initiatives that we have lined up uh, really fit into these kinds of themes. So we have Make in India, Skill India, Startup India, of course Mudra, all of that is intended for job creation. That's the massive employment that I was speaking about. Uh, then we have irrigation, the Pradhan Mantri Kushi Sichai Yojana, the soil health card, fertilizer subsidy, subsidy rationalization, pumping much more agriculture credit into the rural economy. That's all designed to provide more prosperity uh, to farmers. Obviously, we are opening up the market as well. Uh, so all of that is intended to make our farming uh, community much more prosperous. Uh, and then Garibon Ka Udhar, which is the upliftment of the poor, eliminating poverty, that uh, you know is around basic needs such as food and health, social security, which is what we're doing with Jandhan, uh, Jeevan Jyoti Bhima Yojana, uh, Suraksha Bhima Yojana, which are the insurance programs, Atal Pension Yojana for retirement. So all of those come under the social security bucket. And then of course we are moving to uh, affordable housing uh, and housing for all, which is another one of our very important initiatives. So you can see that the initiatives, uh, the terms that you know uh, we have coined, uh, the phrases that we have, Make in India, Skill India, and all of that, those are very important initiatives that fit overall into these three important thrust areas for young people, for our agricultural sector, and obviously for the poor. Uh, and that's how, in some ways, the peace parts fit together. Now, obviously, to be able to deliver on all of this, you know, we have to have the infrastructure, which is the ports, the highways, the waterways, all of the transportation infrastructure, railways, which is a very, very important priority for us, energy, uh, and to make it clean and green as much as possible, and then housing and urbanization. So these are the infrastructure sectors, all of which that support these three thrust areas. Uh, and then, of course, we have our financing system, which is what we are doing with our fiscal policy, our taxes. Uh, and then, of course, you know, we are continuously uh, improving uh, the functioning of our financial markets, ensuring that they are more vibrant, broader, deeper, more liquid, and better regulated. And all of this is, of course, uh, 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 sustained by and driven by the Team India concept that I was talking about earlier in terms of cooperative federalism. So this is really how uh, our economic policy fits together in terms of uh, our, different, uh, our different initiatives and our overall priorities. Now, with respect to the budget, uh, 
coming up, what I will say is that all of our uh, important economic documents, including the manifesto that we released before the July, uh, the May 2014 elections, uh, the first budget of July 2014, the next budget of February 2015, and the budget that we're working on for February 2016, all of these important economic documents really emphasize these priorities. Uh, which is to ensure that our young people, our farmers, uh, and of course our poor are looked after. And even as we work on these priorities, uh, obviously another very important set of beneficiaries for us are the middle class, uh, but if we work on urbanization, if we improve infrastructure, we create jobs for our young people, we improve uh, housing stock, those are the kinds of things that will improve the quality of life uh, for the middle class uh, in our cities as well. So this is really the way we kind of think about our economic policy uh, and these are the, the themes that we have pursued and we've consistently pursued those uh, over over the last uh, two years as I was mentioning. Uh, now I have come back on right now, yes. Okay, thank you very much Ant. There's a lot there that you've laid out and I, I don't want to preempt too much the comments uh, that our discussants might make so let me just bring this framework you provided to the present day. We're sitting here today uh, uh, amidst uh, the din of Indian politics, the winter session is ongoing, the goods and services tax, which is one of the landmark reforms that your government is pushing, the previous government also had pushed, uh, is waiting in the, in, hanging in the balance. Uh, we have a new report out by the chief economic advisor, Arvind Subramaniam, which is recommending perhaps that some key changes be made to the GST that might placate the opposition, might make for a better GST. Tell us a little bit about A, where the GST stands today, and B, if you think about the winter session as a whole, what are the key priorities on the economic side that you would like to push that flow from this framework that you've so nicely laid out? So, so Milan, that's several questions rolled into one. So let me try and address them one after the other. Uh, first, it's uh, it's a little amusing that you talk about the din in Parliament, uh, because uh, today, this afternoon, uh, in the Lok Sabha, I actually uh, piloted uh, uh, a bill, which is the Indian uh, Trust uh, Amendment Bill. And this is an act that was uh, first promulgated in 1882. Uh, so we amended it today am amid the din uh, I must say my colleagues from the Congress uh, did their best to shout down uh, the discussion, but we had our headsets on uh, and we, we continued and, uh, and we got it passed. Uh, so indeed, you're right, it is quite noisy. It is a real win uh, in Parliament right now, which is uh, very unfortunate, I must say, uh, because this is a vitally important uh, winter session uh, for us. Uh, there are uh, three or four uh, very key uh, legislati legislation uh, uh, that we are trying to put through uh, and those will have a tremendous impact on our economy and first and foremost of course uh, is GST. Now with respect to GST uh, in terms of either uh, the, uh, the administrative aspect of it or the analytical aspect of it which is of course you know what Arvind has done in his committee uh, in terms of looking at uh, rate structures and revenue neutral rates uh, or in terms of building the consensus among the uh, state finance ministers. Our government uh, has been very proactive and very responsible uh, in putting those building blocks in place. And really the final act in this play at this point now uh, is getting uh, the GST passed by a two-thirds majority in the Rajya Sabha. It's the 122nd constitutional amendment. It's not uh, a bill that can be passed through uh, a simple majority or through a joint session of parliament. This is a constitutional amendment that will require a two-thirds majority in the Rajya Sabha. Now, our sense is that uh, uh, if it were to come to a discussion and a straight vote, uh, it would be uh, uh, quite, uh, even, and even if the Congress voted against it, it would be very close. We might even uh, be able to pull off uh, a two-thirds majority. As you know, the, the Congress is about 60 plus seats out of 243, uh, so two-thirds majority would require about 180 or so uh, people uh, to, uh, 160 or so people to approve it, and I think we're close to those numbers. Uh, so we really feel like if we can have a proper debate uh, in Parliament and then a vote, uh, even without potentially Congress support, we have a chance of passing it. 
Of course, we want to have Congress support. This is a very important bill for India. We want to forge a national consensus. We've achieved that with the state finance ministers. We want to bring the Congress on board. Uh, and as best as we can tell, as we were negotiating uh, in good faith with uh, our colleagues from the Congress, uh, they brought up three conditions that they said were necessary uh, for uh, the bill to be accept uh, acceptable to them. Uh, and uh, we responded to those three conditions. Uh, we explained which ones were feasible and which could be done. Uh, we explained which ones uh, were not uh, in the best interest of the country. Uh, and I think we, uh, at, a, at a substance level, uh, have brought the gap down between us and their position uh, to a very narrow gap at this stage. That's uh, how we feel about it from a substance point of view. But unfortunately, Milan, as you well know, uh, whether it is uh, the US Congress, uh, Westminster in the UK, uh, or even uh, our parliament, uh, substance uh, very often is set aside uh, and we have to deal with the raw politics uh, of uh, the situation. Uh, and as far as the raw politics are concerned, uh, as I was saying earlier, the din in parliament, uh, the, 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 uh, the, the approach that the Congress has taken at this point uh, concerns us greatly because uh, it does appear that uh, you know, GST uh, will come down to the wire. Uh, and if indeed the Congress blocks it at this point, uh, it will be quite, quite damaging for India uh, if, if we are unable to pass it. Uh, let me just ask you on GST, I mean, are you optimistic about its prospects? I mean, I think many investors, many analysts, many Indians are looking uh, to say, you know, uh, this is really the critical moment. Uh, it seems that substantively the sides are so close. Uh, especially because there now has been some back and forth about the three conditions that Congress has placed. Are you optimistic that Parliament can get this done this winter session? Well, I'm an eternal optimist, Milan, so we'll keep trying for the sake of the country and for the sake of the citizens of India. Uh, this is quite important. We obviously have to keep working on it and we will work on it. Um, you know, at, at this point, uh, the administrative side of it uh, is fairly straightforward. We could implement the bill on April 1, 2016 uh, from an administrative uh, perspective. The legislative side is complicated because obviously we need the two-thirds majority in the Rajya Sabha. We need 50% of the states to approve it. And then we have to get the GST bill passed as well. Uh, and the GST bill has to be passed uh, in Parliament, Lok Sabha and Rajya Sabha, uh, and then in all the states as well because that will set uh, the rate structure it will set which goods and services belong in which of the uh, the rate uh, categories, you know, the concessional rate, the standard rate, or the luxury rate. So there's a lot of heavy lifting to be done on the legislative side, uh, which uh, which makes this uh, uh, challenging in terms of April 1, 2016. Uh, if indeed the legislation uh, gets passed uh, across the center and the states, uh, then there's no reason why we can't implement this uh, in uh, in the year at, at, at any point because this is after all a transaction tax and then when it kicks in it can just kick in uh, on all of those uh, transactions. But there's one uh, final thing that I would say to all of you regarding GST which is uh, often I find in the media or among investors there's always the silver bullet idea which is oh my god if I could just get the GST passed or this to happen or land reform to happen uh, then that would be the solution to all of our problems. But it's not like that. The GST is extraordinarily important, but the bankruptcy code is very important to uh, what we're doing with respect to uh, the Prevention of Corruption Act, public, public procurement, what we're doing with the National Infrastructure Fund. All of these other priorities are also extremely important and will certainly provide a boost to the economy as well. Uh, so we'll keep pushing as far as GST is concerned. Uh, it'll happen uh, sooner rather than later. But we do have a lot of other, uh, I think, uh, very important initiatives underway. Uh, you may call them big bang, game changers, whatever label you want to uh, use. Uh, but I would say they are very, very uh, impactful initiatives as well. Thank you, Dan, for those, uh, those thoughtful responses. Uh, let me now turn to Sadanand Dume from AEI and the Wall Street Journal. Um, Sadanand, you've written a lot about the Modi government's first 18 months, uh, I think the hits and misses on the economic reform side. Uh, what are your thoughts in response to what the minister has just said about the strategy, both in terms of what we've seen thus far and you know, where they hope to go going, uh, you know, from here on out? Well, thanks, Milam. Thanks for uh, moderating this, and thank you, Jarrett, for your comments, which are, as usual, succinct and very clear. 
Um, I'm going to make just a few broad points so that we can then just you know move on to Pranjal and then after that open it up to discussion. I'm going to make basically three big points. Um, the first is that I can understand the politics that is underlying the Modi government's approach to economic reform. And I would, if I had to sum that up in a word, I would sum it up as cautious. Uh, this is not to say that they aren't doing things. They're doing many things as, as, as giant play. But I would say that if in political terms they're being cautious, and then I'll talk a little bit about why I can understand that. The second point that flows from that is the desire in the government to be seen as reformers or to capture the narrative of reform or capture the mantle of reform. Uh, I think that is problematic. I think the government is struggling with that. We've seen a series of reports. We've seen a series of articles and editorials about it. I know Jayant and I disagree on why this is so, but I'll lay out why I feel that the politics <laughs> of this, as the government seems to be, seems to have uh, embraced this co the uh, this idea, kind of goes against <clears throat> them successfully claiming the mantle of reform because there is a set narrative of what you need to do, and they don't seem particularly interested in some of those elements. They are interested in other elements. The third quick point I'm going to make is what, how this might impact the BJP's odds of winning a second term in 2019. And I know that this is far off, and uh, I, where it's, it's difficult to judge this with certainty, but I want to just lay out two quick options, one which would be positive for the party, one which would maybe a little bit problematic. Now, coming to the first point, which is what, this, what, what does this look like in terms of politics? I completely understand this. It makes sense to frame their strategy as pro-poor. In a country like India, which is a developing country, it is absolutely stupid and suicidal to be seen as championing economic policies that are not pro-poor. And I think across the spectrum, you know, all the way from the left all the, to the right, all serious people agree that the objective of Indian economic reform is to eradicate poverty. So there's no question that that is the sensible thing to do, and we can see where they're coming from. You can see why it makes sense to focus on agricultural productivity. You can see why uh, with about half of India's workforce in agriculture. You can see why it makes sense to focus on infrastructure. It's a crying need. Various governments have spoken about this over the years. And talking about jobs, cooperative federalism, all these elements that uh, Jan laid out very, very nicely. Um, it also makes sense given the context that most of the political opposition that the BJP faces is from the left, right? You have this jibe of being a so-called suit boot ki sarkar, um, which is essentially trying to paint the government as a government that does not care about the poor. I think that's, of course, untrue. But that's the political context in which they are operating. And it's completely understandable that they are going to try and ward that off. I think the problem arises when it comes to a very small group of people who are not necessarily influential in a sort of immediate electoral sense, but are influential in another sense. And by this, I mean the people who are in the investment banks. I mean people who are analysts, people who are writing for the major global financial newspapers, the major Indian financial newspapers, and so on. Now, why is why are most people in this cohort reluctant to say that this government is an aggressively reformist government. And I think the reason for that is actually quite simple. There is a narrative about Indian reform that predates 2014. 2014 is not year zero for India. The narrative goes back. In some cases, it's 10 years. some cases, it's 15 years. Uh, there are several uh, things, several issues, several policies that people have been expecting this government, especially when it, after it was elected to take up. Um, for, in, for example, uh, disinvestment or privatization is a very major one. Here we see that the government has so far been actually very cautious. It's gone more slowly than the Vajpayee government and its policies in terms of, at least so far, resisting complete privatization, even of loss-making private public sector companies resembles more the caution of the last UPA government than some of the boldness of the Vajpayee government. Similarly, there was an expectation on various other issues 
for instance, of the re retroactive tax, in my opinion, quite politically low-hanging fruit, not particularly controversial, would have been dealt with in a decisive manner, would simply have been uh, abrogated. Uh, instead, the government has taken a more cautious approach, saying that, listen, we don't agree with retroactive tax, we will not use it, but we're going to keep it on the books. So you can go down the list, you can, you can talk about various things, you can talk about the approach to banking, you can talk about the approach to subsidy reform, but the basic thing is that there is a checklist that predates 2014. That checklist is what most analysts are working off. What the government is now saying is, look, we've done all these other things. And I'm not saying they're bad things, they're good things. They've done Jandhan Yojana, Atal Bihari, the Atal Pension Plan. They've, they're, they're doing a whole bunch of things that are not on the pre-existing list. But my argument is that the narrative is going to be shaped by the pre-existing list. And as long as the government does not come to terms with some things on that, on that list, it will not truly be seen as a full-blooded reformist government. Third quick point, what are the implications of this? I think that if the government pulls this off, if they are able to put in place the policies they say that they are pursuing, if GST goes through, bankruptcy goes through, if they continue to attract foreign investment, they've been very successful, by the way, in attracting foreign investment in the first year. If that success continues, foreign investors continue to say that this is a government that means business, uh, they continue to have strong macroeconomic success as they have, bringing down inflation. It is quite possible that they will be able to sell this to the people as having worked. The danger, though, is twofold. The, one part of the danger is that perhaps this program, which is relatively cautious, will not do what they want it to do in terms of jobs and in terms of growth. We don't know, the jury is not out, is still out on that. But that is a danger, that it may not be, it may not generate the jobs and growth that the government, that people are expecting, and that there will be disappointment. The second danger is a little bit more subtle, and this is really about, you know, narrative, and it's about how a party claims intellectual space in the sort of ongoing uh, uh, fights in Indian politics. And I think that what the, the BJP coming in in 2014 had a really big opportunity where it had taken a large chunk of people who would regard themselves as economic conservatives or libertarians. And these are people writing op-eds. And I can understand how, why an elected politician like Jayanth can, would, would, would feel that these people may not count for much. Um, and I respect that. But the fact is that there was a large body of elite opinion makers, whatever their, their sort of grassroots appeal may be, of elite opinion makers who were extremely optimistic, extremely bullish about this government, and many of whom are now either on the fence or who are disappointed. And I think that in the long term for this government, going ahead and looking at how it is perceived by the elites and how that ends up filtering down, uh, this uh, loss of control of the narrative is something that I would pay attention to. And that's it. All right. Thank you so much. Uh, I, I'm sure Jayanth is uh, quite eager to make some comments, but I just ask him to refrain for a couple minutes. Uh, and we'll now turn to Pranjal Bandari from the Chief e e Economist uh, for HSBC. I should also mention she has served previously in the Government of India working uh, with the chief economic advisor, so has the unique vantage point of having been on the inside. Uh, Pranjal? Yeah, hi. Uh, no, thanks for this opportunity. Uh, I think there's a general feeling that the reform agenda is well thought out, uh, you know, the one which, uh, which Jayant just presented. And, and really, I must congratulate the minister uh, for his comprehensive reform plan across the different sectors of the economy. But I think the main concern right now is the timelines. Uh, and there is a sense of urgency, there's a, there's a sense of impatience building up uh, because recovery continues to be on a wobbly footing. Now, you know, we look at this very carefully. We track about 25 to 30 different activity indicators uh, and we map them to the different sectors of uh, GDP. What we find is that about 50% of GDP is improving, but the other 50% is not. In fact, some of it is worsening uh, month after month. Uh, 
an even more interesting thing here is what is really driving the improvement in the 50% that is improving. Here, the oil bounty, the dramatic fall in oil prices actually plays a very important role. Uh, you know, oil prices have fallen from $40 a barrel, uh, from $110 a barrel to about $40 a barrel. Uh, they've had huge macroeconomic benefits across the economy, brought down input costs for manufacturers, improved purchasing power for urban consumers, uh, bought a lot of savings for the government, which the government has definitely been able to channelize into higher capital spending. And all of this is the green part, the 50% of the economy which is recovering. But come next year, and the incremental benefit from the oil bounty is not likely to be as significant. You know, much of the gains from oil falling from 110 to 40 have already been utilized, have already been accrued. So I really worry about what's going to drive growth in the next couple of years. I especially worry about 2016. What's really going to drive growth then? So you know, any thoughts uh, from the uh, from the minister on this will be very useful. I want to uh, uh, you know make a comment on on the fiscal situation, and I think there's going to be a lot of questions uh, on this in the next couple of months. Um, you know, the government, the minister has spoken about the fact that he's facing a fiscal trilemma, uh, and I don't envy his position at all. It's really a difficult position to be in. Uh, the the government has to do has to meet three objectives on the fiscal front simultaneously. They need to bring down the fiscal deficit. Uh, they need to continue to do capital investment because the private sector is not ready to do it as yet. And they need to finance a fund, a high wage bill. Now, our own calculations show that this would require the government uh, to get about 0.8% of GDP worth of fresh funds next year you know, to meet all these objectives simultaneously. Where is this going to come from? Uh, this is the big trilemma that the government is facing. But you know, if you think with a different lens, it's actually hardly a trilemma. If there was ever a silver bullet, I think the government has it, no has it now. If the government can actually ramp up on, on this investment, sell many of its stakes uh, in public-owned companies, it can actually get a lot of resources which will help it meet its fiscal, you know, all the fiscal objectives simultaneously. And I wonder here, what really happens year after year? At the start of the year, you have the government which comes up with these ambitious disinvestment targets. For this year, it was 695 billion rupees, uh, but by the end of the year, Disinvestment is the main source of disappointment. Uh, you know, this year it's likely to be more like 300 billion uh, rupees. You know, half of what the budget estimate was, and this is something we've seen in this government and also in the previous government. So, what is it about disinvestment which is the main source of hope at the start of uh, you know of 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 a, of a fiscal year and the main source of disappointment at the end of the fiscal year? You know, any thoughts on that would be very useful because this could be one way in which the fiscal dilemma could actually be solved. Uh, so over to you, uh, Milan, uh, or, or the minister. Whoever. Yeah, thanks, Prandru. I mean, I think there's, uh, I'd like to turn to Jayanth now to get some reactions. I mean, I think there's two types of critiques. One is from Sadanand, which is really about the narrative, right, which is in order to change the narrative, uh, there are particular reforms this government could, that which they could pursue, namely disinvestment, strategic disinvestment, privatization, uh, um, but yet they've been very slow off the block. This actually is quite linked to where Prandrel ended, which is you have this ominous fiscal trilemma uh, of, you know, you've got to, you've got to shrink the fisc, you've got to uh, increase or keep robust capex expenditures, uh, you've got to deal with the one rank, one pension, the seventh pay commission, these issues, and disinvestment may be perhaps the way in which that you can, you can address these issues. Uh, if you, I'd love for you to, to get your response on this and any other issues which which our two discussants brought up. You know, thank you very much, Milan, and thank you, Sadanand and Pranjul, for your uh, very thoughtful commentary. Uh, it seems to me that uh, your concerns or uh, uh, your uh, your approach, uh, looking at uh, uh, the situation right now. Uh, is on the one hand at a philosophical level, which is where I would suggest that most of Sadhanan's comments were, uh, and then for Pranjul, uh, much more at the sort of data uh, and the fiscal uh, side, which is really the mechanics, the tactics of how you actually do the policy making. So uh, on the one hand, you know, Sadhanan has a critique which is philosophical and around the narrative. On the other hand, Pranjul has a critique or a set of comments uh, it's more around the numbers and the data and the analytics. So let me try and handle both. I'll start with the philosophical uh, 
uh, side uh, that uh, Sadana was bringing up uh, and uh, his uh, his uh, questions uh, and issues around the narrative. Uh, you know, many of you heard me talk about this joke uh, where uh, there is an inebriated gentleman uh, looking for uh, his keys uh, and he's looking for it under the lamppost uh, and then somebody goes and asks him, well, you know, your keys could be anywhere in the darkness. Why are you looking for it under the lamppost? Uh, and then the gentleman says, well, that's where the light is. Uh, and in some ways, uh, you know, the, the analysis and the discussion uh, around our reform agenda I find is uh, basically uh, very sharply and narrowly focused on four or five uh, items that as uh, Sadhanan says uh, for a certain influential community uh, is really what they've been carrying around on a little card close to their, their heart for a long time and it includes uh, GST, it includes land reform, it includes labor reform and it includes privatization. This is it. You do these four things then you're a reformist. If you, if you don't do these four things, you've lost the plot, you're not a reformist, uh, and uh, and the whole thing doesn't add up. Uh, and that, I think, as I said, uh, about you know, the gentleman under the lamppost uh, is in some ways uh, not understanding the full picture. Now, even on these four items, there are you know, a lot of important things that are happening and have happened, and I'll touch on those, and in particular, I'll talk about disinvestment because that is something both at, a, at an analytical numbers level that Pranjal has brought up, uh, and for uh, for Sadanand is uh, is an important uh, totemic uh, signal of where we are relative to uh, our reformist credentials. But first, let me tell you uh, that if you actually look at what we've done, whether it is the auctioning of the natural resources, the coal and the uh, iron ore auctions, uh, the spectrum auctions, uh, whether you consider what we've done in terms of the financial sector, where for ten years not a single bank was licensed. Uh, and in 18 months, we have licensed 23 banks. If you look at the investment that's flowing into roads and railways, uh, if you look at what we've done as far as really building out a social security platform is concerned, uh, what we've done to dismantle agricultural markets and the APMC, uh, and if you look at many, many sectors of the economy, what we've just done with distribution companies, uh, and see how radical and how uh, important these reforms are that we are undertaking. And I haven't even talked about fiscal policy, the devolution of uh, an additional 10% from 32% of and to 42% of the state. We've completely changed the fiscal architecture of the Indian state with uh, uh, with the devolution, with what we're doing with corporate taxes, and of course what we're going to do with GST. So these are extraordinarily important reforms. As I said, a big bang is in the eye of the beholder. So whether you call it a game changer or a big bang or radical, a silver bullet, you can use whatever term you want. But I think anybody whose objective and looks at you know what has been unleashed would agree that these are extraordinarily profound and significant steps uh, that we have taken uh, and that by any measure, any objective measure, you would have to conclude that this is a, an intensely reformist agenda that's driven philosophically by a supply side orientation and investment driven approach uh, and it, all the pieces fit together as I said because on the one hand you want to obviously uh, do the right moral thing for the poor of the country, provide them a safety net, eliminate poverty and on the other hand ensure that our markets work well, competitive forces are unleashed, innovation happens and our businesses and our companies really move forward as aggressive and very, very uh, capable global competitors. This two-part vision of how the economy should evolve, I think it's very clear, it's very reformist and we have followed through uh, on very important aspects of this. Now, with respect to the, the, the sort of uh, checklist, uh, as far as labor reform is concerned, we are doing a lot, we've cleaned up a lot at the central level, a lot of it has moved into the states. We think this is the benefit of cooperative federalism, where more progressive states can take on and get a lot done. This is clearly happening in Rajasthan, it's happening in Madhya Pradesh, it's happening in my home state of Jharkhand, where you know, labor reform is happening uh, on an ongoing continuous basis. Similarly, land reform has moved into the states. There is, in fact, I find very often uh, a confusion about the land reform bill. People don't realize that the land reform bill was intended only for the use of eminent domain, public purpose, so that it doesn't have any bearing on businesses. It only has a bearing on how fast the state can build infrastructure and acquire land uh, for public purposes. But in any case, land reform has moved to the states, which is where it's happening very quickly. Many states now have very reformist and very progressive uh, legislation associated with land. 
and then of course GST as you know we discussed it at length and we in fact have been able to forge the consensus across 31 states to get GST to a point where even uh, even the Congress agrees uh, that the rate structures, the revenue neutral rate uh, are where they should be. So we are so close to getting GST passed. Uh, so three out of four are right there. Now I will touch on disinvestment, uh, which everybody keeps bringing up. Uh, and many people come to me and say, well, why don't you privatize Air India? Why don't you privatize BSNL? The reality is that one has to look at disinvestment in a measured way. These are assets that belong to the people of India. Both Air India and BSNL right now are not doing particularly well. There is a very important need to professionalize them, strengthen them, make them successful, profit generating enterprises before we can even talk about, about disinvestments for that. We have a very clear plan for disinvesting, disinvesting loss making enterprises. That's moving forward and we have already announced, we've already announced that our stake in IDBI Bank is going to come down to below 49%. And that IDBI bank will be transformed in the same way that we have transformed Access Bank. Uh, so we are absolutely thinking through strategic disinvestment in a very structured, methodical way. We're taking on the targets that make the most sense. And by the way, let me also tell you this, which is just because we haven't said things in public doesn't mean we're, work we're not working on it. So we're working on a whole host of uh, very interesting and important possibilities as far as strategic disinvestment is concerned. Uh, and that work is ongoing. now. Uh, the question is, well, why are we not closer to the 69,500 uh, crore target that we had laid out in the budget? We would love to be. We would like to be. Uh, but of course, the flip side uh, of the oil price declines uh, is the fact that we've had tremendous slowdown on the commodity complex. Uh, and many of the companies that were lined up for, uh, for disinvestment, whether it's Coal India, NMDC, uh, some of the oil marketing companies and so on, have also been hit hard by the decline in these commodity prices. With markets being as volatile as they are, the prices that we are getting uh, for these companies right now would be so low that none of you uh, as Indian citizens would want them to be taken to the market uh, at these prices. Uh, so if you check the prices of all of the companies that are in the pipeline right now, you'll see they're trading at, at their lows. Uh, and so it's really not a good time to be taking them out into the market. And so we are doing an adjustment. We are thinking through if indeed those that we had lined up early in the year for disinvestment are not ready in terms of their valuations, let's consider other ones. And those are the ones we're considering, for example, uh, IDPI. So, you know, again, uh, for, uh, for Sadanan and a group of influential opinion makers and thought leaders, uh, disinvestment is kind of a litmus test. Uh, of course, we understand uh, all the issues associated with it. We are working through uh, the, the appropriate uh, uh, companies that we can we can take to the market at good valuations, and we are working hard on that. I will make a final point about disinvestment, and then I'll get to Pranjul's point uh, about the fiscal trilemma and so on. But final point about disinvestment, strategic disinvestment that you should know, uh, is that during uh, the NDA government uh, led by uh, Shri Atal Bihari Vajpayee, uh, of course, there were some uh, strategic disinvestments, privatization. Uh, and the people who did that were then hauled through some very painful investigations. They were hauled into, uh, uh, into court to defend what they had done. And so part of what we've had to do is to put in place a robust and defensible process so that no government in the future can question the integrity and the judgment that is applied through a privatization process. Uh, you have to remember that uh, when we privatize the process, the valuation, uh, the actual uh, transaction, all of this can be questioned uh, and uh, bureaucrats are very reluctant to put recommendations unless it is a defensible watertight process. So that's really what we are putting in place right now, a defensible watertight process to be able to go through uh, with uh, these strategic uh, disinvestments. So that's essentially my response uh, you know, to uh, Sadhanand at a philosophical level. Uh, which is that A, uh, you know, even the checklist that you're talking about, I think we're moving forward uh, quite well uh, and uh, in a, quite a sophisticated way on that checklist. Uh, but at the same time, you're ignoring uh, dozens of other very important things that we're doing uh, that are equally, uh, if not more impactful uh, than the four that you have outlined. I would say GST, the corporate tax code, uh, the opening up of the financial markets, all of these are very, very impactful uh, efforts that, that we have undertaken that uh, people don't spend a lot of time talking about, but a very important part of the reform narrative as well. 
Now, after laying out my views on the philosophical side, uh, I'll turn now to Pranjul's point about the numbers. Now, you should know that when we do our budget planning, we have uh, you know lots and lots of and uh, scenarios that we run. We have very sophisticated, uh, uh, very complicated spreadsheets. Uh, which we work through to understand, uh, you know, what the different parameters are and the variables are uh, that uh, that will uh, that will enable us to meet our fiscal targets. Uh, we did run all of those numbers uh, in the February 2015 budget, taking into account what we thought would happen through one rank one pension uh, and the seventh pay commission. Uh, and on the basis of that is when we came up with the fiscal consolidation roadmap of 3.9 percent, 3.5 percent, and 3 percent. Uh, so we had already modeled that in, in our medium term fiscal planning. We've obviously rerun all those numbers and those spreadsheets. Uh, and it seems to us that we will be able to uh, handle the impact of the seven pay commission quite well uh, and that we can stick to our fiscal consolidation roadmap. Uh, and our modeling uh, is uh, telling us. Now with respect to uh, you know the, 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 the one time boost that we got from oil prices, uh, you should remember that even though we had the data tailwind of lower oil prices. We've also had significant headwinds. The commodity complex uh, in terms of prices for iron and steel and aluminum has come down, which has hurt us both in terms of uh, our, uh, our, uh, our tax collections as well as in terms of support uh, that we have to provide the sector. Uh, we obviously have a situation uh, we're dealing with in terms of uh, uh, very slow export markets or exports have been declining. And most importantly, something that is as impactful uh, as far as our economy is concerned as uh, oil prices is agriculture. And our government has now had to deal with two deficient monsoons in a row. Uh, that has not happened in the last 30 years. Last time it happened was 86, 87. Uh, and so we are dealing with that, uh, you know, and, and really trying to ensure that despite that, that the economy moves forward in a robust way. And I think part of what uh, Pranjul is seeing in her numbers is that if 50% of the economy is not trending upwards in a robust way, it's because the agricultural economy is hurting uh, from the two deficient monsoons that we've had. Uh, so those are the puts and takes of any economy. Certain things help you, certain things don't help you. Uh, and so we have to balance all of that out. Uh, finally, I think for next year, uh, there will be some major boosts to the economy coming through. Obviously, uh, we hope that agriculture will strengthen and that we'll have a normal monsoon, which will help us a great deal. Uh, we think that the benefits of public investment and the increased FDI that we've had uh, will also make a big difference uh, to the economy and boost that. And we still are quite optimistic that we can get GST passed. And everybody agrees that if GST is passed, uh, GDP can increase by 0.5% to 1% at a minimum. Uh, we don't know how fast that can happen, what the lag effects are going to be, uh, but definitely we think it will flow through relatively quickly and certainly from a tax revenue perspective uh, will help us a great deal and that can also be along with the strategic disinvestments a way to solve uh, the fiscal trilemma that Pranjul spoke about. Uh, it's now uh, almost 8.30. Uh, I have another two or three minutes, folks, before I sign off, so uh, if, if there are some specific questions you want to ask me, I'd be happy to do that. So I think uh, uh, let's give just quick 60 seconds each to Pranjul and Sadan. And uh, do you have any res comments you'd like to make in response? Well, I guess the main uh, question I have is that you know, considering that you know, Jayanth has a very clear sense of you know, let's just say that the people, the critics, really are under that lamppost, but that is nonetheless a kind of reality. Given that you know that they're under that lamppost, um, why not why not try and check some of those boxes? Because for your own program and for your own sort of you know in in terms of uh, global credibility, it'll be tremendously useful. Sadan and I would say, that as far as those four items are concerned, you know we are moving forward as quickly as we can on GST. We tried our level best. We had, I think, three or four ordinances on the land reform, but we could not uh, develop the national consensus. Obviously, if we don't have a majority in the Rajya Sabha, we cannot pass uh, the land reform bill. So it has had to go to the states where it can be passed. And similarly, on labor reform, uh, we will not be able to pass labor reform in the Rajya Sabha where we don't have a majority. So you have to understand that there are legislative constraints about uh, working through the checklist. 
I've already explained at length as to what we're doing in strategic disinvestment. So uh, as far as those four factors are concerned, everything that we could possibly do given our legislative constraints uh, and uh, you know the lack of majority that we have in the Rajya Sabha, I think we've done that. And I, 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 I would really love to know from anyone if they have a solution uh, for what we are seeing in the Rajya Sabha. Uh, uh, Parandral, we have about two minutes left. Do you have a final question you'd like to pose to the minister based on uh, what he's just laid out? Yeah, just, just a comment. You know, uh, many of the reforms like GST, you know, any action on labor and land, all of these are very important game-changing things. But most of their payoff is in the medium term, you know, in a three to five year or more horizon. Uh, you know, for GST, for example, it could add about 80 bits to, to GDP growth, but it's not going to happen immediately. In fact, in the first year or two, it could really confuse a lot of people. You know, it could it it could have a lot of adjustment costs. And I think the big challenge this government is going to face is how do you handle short-term growth and how do you handle short-term aspirations of people? You know, which can get impatient very quickly uh, when you're only focusing on some of the medium-term reforms and they take time to 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 have their payoff. So I think that's going to be the big challenge. How do you bridge the short-term and and the long-term? You know. The whole gap between so, Ranjul, that. What, Ranjul, what we're doing there is, of course, uh, uh, you know, the programs that we put in place uh, to uh, get social security as well as mudra uh, credit into the hands of people. Uh, so, with social security, whether it's Narega, whether it is, uh, uh, you know, what we're planning to do with uh, uh, with the with the pensions and getting them into people. Uh, bank accounts right away. That way we can get liquidity into the system very quickly uh, by moving them directly into people's bank accounts. Also with mudra and giving people opportunity to uh, uh, to get loans uh, and, and really getting started in these micro enterprises, that's another way of unleashing uh, short term growth. And then finally Startup India also is something that uh, we have put together which we think will be quite exciting. The entrepreneurial ecosystem in India is already booming. Uh, that's where a lot of the growth is, uh, and uh, those are again uh, areas that we are pushing as hard as we can. Uh, and then, of course, public investment, getting big contracts out uh, into uh, the market as quickly as possible, so that construction, which is very labor intensive, can start very quickly. So we're about at the witching hour, uh, and so I think we better end here. We are very grateful to the minister for for taking time out. I think it's wonderful that. Uh, you were willing to, to to engage in this kind of setting so that people could hear your views kind of unvarnished, unfiltered. I also want to thank Pranjal and Sadh Anand for their thoughtful responses. I hope, uh, Jayanth, that maybe a year from now we could come back. Uh, we'll be closer to the, to the I guess, the 28-month the mark or the 36-month mark, and, uh, and we can hear how things are going then. But thank you again for joining us. Thanks for all who are watching and hope to uh, continue the conversation uh, another day. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.